Whale Boy. Hello, Mr. Shelton. I was wondering what key piece or pieces of data do you think would be most damning to a typical Scientologist's mental resolve and cause them to doubt? I understand that your disillusionment with Scientology took months to build up, but what fact, had you heard it in the depth of your brainwashing, would have shaken your faith the greatest? This is another question that people have asked me in various ways over the last few months. And it's a, it's a near impossible question to answer, which is why I've sort of dragged my heels in getting around to it. Um, I've put a lot of thought into it, in fact. What is it that you could say to a Scientologist that would get him questioning? And, you know, with the study that I've done on the subject, it's, it's become very clear to me uh, what I already had sort of already had the idea of, which is there, there isn't any magic words or magic concept or thing, you know, one size fits all sort of thing you can communicate to all Scientologists that is going to get them to snap out of it or wake up or uh, not believe so hard in what they're doing. There are things you can say to Scientologists, but here's the thing. It's, it's an individual thing. Each person in Scientology is there for their own reasons. And they're, therefore, what they think is important about Scientology is different from person to person. And for example, so you, know, you can see what I'm talking about. I met OTs in Scientology who didn't care at all about the whole track or past lives or even the whole, you know, OT3 Xenu thing. Now, of course, I didn't talk to them about Xenu, but um, what I mean by that is they didn't care about the wonder and, and amazement of body thetans and, and, and spaceships and, and galactic civilizations and all that. It, it didn't mean anything to them because they were in Scientology in order to have a, you know, basically calmer, happier existence. And if this is how they had to go about doing it, then that's what they were gonna do. Whereas I've also met other people in Scientology who couldn't get enough of all of that whole track space opera, spaceship, and galactic civilization stuff, and they wouldn't shut up about it. And they went on and on and on about that, and that was their go button for being in Scientology is, is all of that, is all that hoopaloo about uh, you know, how we've lived on er I know, earlier on other planets, and, and there's spaceships out there, and they come around to Earth and check us out and they know about Scientology. Oh, there's, there's all kinds of crazy conspiracy theories in Scientology about this kind of stuff. So, point being, each individual Scientologist you have to talk to individually. You have to find out what their go buttons are, what their reasons are for, for being involved in the first place, and then address those. And every Scientologist will have a, a chink in their armor, a thing that they have doubts or reservations about, especially now. I mean, after you know all this time with all this stuff out there on the interwebs and all that, uh, you know, it's not that Scientologists don't know anything about this stuff, and uh, it's not that they don't see abuses in the organization with the the overredging and everything else. So, if you can, the the thing that re, that is required in order to produce those chinks in the armor and get through to those people is is truly caring about them, uh, real compassion for their situation, and getting across to them in a way that they will listen to. And that means that you got to be, you know, honest, open, and, um, and caring with them. Real love, you know, is, is what's going to get through in the case of family members and whatnot. So, so that's what it takes. And, and with that bridge in place, that bridge of, of, of caring, I guess you could say, you then have somebody who's willing to listen to you, and then you can get through to them. So that's my answer.